Julian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mab. Glad to be here. I should say welcome back. We had you on not too long ago, episode 231. Listeners, you should view this as sort of a two-part series. Um, we got such a great response, decided to have you back on. That was a pretty broad discussion. I wanted to get a little deeper here today on a topic that's near and dear to everyone's heart, SPACs. So what's your best idea right now? Yeah, thanks, Meb, for having me back on the show. So my best idea in the current environment is a strategy we call SPAC arbitrage, which is something that probably most investors are unfamiliar with, but it's very similar to, I call it merger arbitrage is younger brother. It's a similar type exposure with uh, some unique differences. So we really like SPAC arbitrage just given the low risk, high upside opportunity. I like calling it uh, equity upside with the risk profile of treasury security. So I'm excited to get into that uh, trading strategy today. It's everyone's sort of dream combination. Uh, you're not one for hyperbole, but I did see you at some point referring to SPAC ARB as almost the holy grail of investing. So <laughs> listeners, if you're not salivating already, uh, get ready to. So let's take a step back. Everyone in the news is talking about SPACs every day. You have uh, Chamath and, and Ackman and others uh, talking about these big, massive, multi-hundred million, billion dollar sort of SPACs. What is a SPAC? Uh, give, us, give us a broad overview and then we'll start to dive into this concept of ARB. Right, so let's start at the basics. What a SPAC is, it stands for a special purpose acquisition company, also known as a blank check company. Now they've been around for a very long time, was a very niche market or even nichier that it is. Now it's only about an $80 billion market. So for some context, that's like half the size of uh, Bitcoin's market cap or double the size of cannabis stocks. And so it is still a fairly small market, but the way these things work, is they uh, IPO, they go public on a stock market at generally $10 per unit, raising on average two to $300 million. It could be as small as a $50 million IPO, or as you indicated, Ackman's SPAC raised a record $4 billion, which is just uh, massive. And so they go public in uh, unit form, and these units are made up of a, a common share, plus typically a fraction of a warrant, just to incentivize mostly hedge fund managers to buy in the IPO liquidity providers, give some additional equity upside. And, and all a SPAC is, this blank check company, is it's a pile of cash that they raise in the IPO and then they go on their quest to find a private company to merge with and, and bring them public. And they generally yep. only have a limited amount of time to do that, which is uh, typically two years. And they're not allowed to do anything with the cash that they raise aside from invest in short-term treasuries. So there is, there's not much risk for them to go down. Like we look at what we call the net asset value or the uh, cash in treasury held and, and they start at $10 slowly accrue interest. It's not a lot these days, you know, 15 basis points, but at the end of the two years, if they haven't struck a deal, then they either liquidate, and, and pay you uh, your money back plus accrued interest. And that's like a key dynamic, um, unless they have a, a deal and then uh, they merge and you have this new public company. So you've had some pretty famous names uh, in the news, Virgin Galactic, Open Door and others. Um, and, and since we recorded a continued explosion in number of SPACs, um, Talk to me a little bit about the dynamics, why that's happening right now. Uh, and also, we'll, we'll, I'd like to walk through like a, tr a typical SPAC sort of um, uh, example as well. But, but why is everyone all of a sudden doing SPACs and why is everyone all of a sudden interested? That's a great question, Matt. So it's basically driven by two factors, one on the demand side and one on the supply side. So on the demand side, what we've seen in the markets over the past 20 years is a steady decline in US publicly listed securities. A lot of uh, M&A go private, things of that nature. And on the opposite side of the coin, we've seen the emergence of large pools of capital in the private space, whether they're private equity, leverage buyouts, uh, venture capital, just a ton of capital flooding that side of things where 
in you know the large early stage growth opportunities take uber for example by the time it was public all of its growth was behind them they went public at what like a 50 billion dollar valuation or something crazy such that post ipo the performance of the stock has not been great it's not like getting in on uh, apple or microsoft uh, their stage of growth which was far far earlier what we're seeing up until say this year is a large of the a lot of these large um, private growth companies waiting until all the growth juice is squeezed out of them prior uh, to going public. But with the success of certain SPACs, and I think that Virgin Galactic was probably one of the first to really spur this trend, and, and arguably DraftKings as well, where it was shown that these private companies that were still fairly early stage, I call them sort of late stage venture capital, series D type, series E round opportunities, where their pre-profitability, or in some cases pre-revenue, where the previous theory was that, oh, public market investors, they're too short term, they're only concerned about the next quarter. They're not gonna support a company that's in which revenue is five years out. Oh, However, we see Virgin Galactic go public and the stock just goes bananas. And turns out there's significant uh, public investor demand, retail investor demand for these late stage type VC opportunities that they haven't had access to because they were only for venture capital funds in the private market. And so you've had this dynamic on the demand side where there in fact is a lot of demand for early stage growth opportunities and public market investors really haven't been able to have exposure to those in quite a while ever since you know the private funding market sort of crowded them out and you know these great growth opportunities decided to just stay in the private space for longer and longer so that's on the demand side and concurrently on the supply side you've had a number of sponsors private equity firms, hedge funds, venture capital firms, they're always looking to raise assets in order to generate fees. Now the SPAC model has a certain component in terms of what's known as a sponsor promote or effectively free shares to the tune of upwards of 20% of the company. So you have this um, fairly large potential compensation available to the sponsor if they were to successfully execute on a SPAC business combination when they launch one of these. So I consider it on the supply side, the monetization of one's reputation and network. And you mentioned uh, a guy like Chamath. And in my opinion, I actually call him the, uh, the SPAC master on our podcast because he's been so successful just raising. He launched three SPACs last week, raising uh, cumulative $2.1 billion. And that represents upwards of like half a billion dollars of promote value <laughs> in uh, him and his partner's genes. And so if you can utilize your reputation and your network to first off raise the capital within the SPAC, and then secondly, put together an attractive business combination with a private company, then it can be incredibly lucrative for the sponsors. So it's really the combination of these two dynamics such that you know, significant retail interest and even institutional interest in publicly listed uh, late stage VC type opportunities. And on the other side, um, you know, sponsors such as uh, alternative asset managers coming into the space for the, uh, the promote or the yeah. free share of this competition. I think, I think you just uh, hit the nail on the head with a lot of the interest from all sides. Um, it's kind of the perfect storm. You have uh, sexy companies uh, like DraftKings and Virgin Galactic and Open Door. You have VCs that want to get liquidity. Um, you have markets at all time highs. So you have investors clamoring for the, the new hot deal. And then on the promote side, you have arguably the most um, rewarding setup I, I can even think of. So let's walk through an example just so we get the math right. Let's say Chamath says, I'm gonna do a billion dollar SPAC, Jan 1, 2021. This will be IPOQ, which will probably be on at that point. <laughs> um, so of that billion dollars, he's gotta put up, let's call it what, 20, 30 million as far as just expenses to, to get this ball rolling or is it that much yeah. or not that much? Yeah, like, so it's not, Free shares, like many people accuse, certainly these 
these seed shares or this promote, they pay like a nominal sum, like $25,000. But given that the SPAC can't touch the trust value raised in the IPO, they do have significant expenses to run it over the two years uh, and run it as a, you know, a company in search of a target. And in order to fund it, they typically subscribe the sponsors due to uh, private placement warrants. If the IPO is at $10, these warrants would be struck at $11.50. And on average, that's for roughly 3% of the IPO value. So say it's a $1 billion SPAC IPO, the sponsor would be putting up $30 million in what we refer to as at-risk capital, whereas they don't get a deal, that goes to zero. Or if they put together a deal and the stock doesn't go above 1150 then it's also worthless. And so there is skin in the game there. But And where does the promote fee come in? Of that billion dollars, is it coming out of that? Does it get diluted on the upside? Like how, how does that work? Yeah, it's additional dilution. So it'd be effectively $200 million of additional shares issued to the sponsor upon successful consummation of a business domination. Man, that, 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 that is some juicy uh, business right there. Goodness. Nice work if you uh, can get it. So, you know, it's funny because you have a lot of the VCs kind of gnashing their teeth and pulling their hair out about direct listings versus IPO. And it seems like um, there's benefits to kind of all the different models. And you can kind of flow chart if you want to raise capital, if you don't want to raise capital. Um, but on average, uh, you know, the, and also the SPAC has some different disclosure requirements. Um, you can make forward looking statements typically, which you usually can't. And, and by the way, you're the SPAC king. So correct me if I'm, <laughs> this is just my understanding. Yeah. Um, it. But it seems on average, a more expensive way to go public than an IPO, true or false? Well, it depends. It can, it can generally be either. And so if we review kind of the three ways of going public, there's the direct listing, which is only suitable for these very large private companies that don't need growth capital, where they just put their shares out on the public market and, and let it trade like um, you know, Spotify or, or Slack. Then you have traditional IPO, which say over the past 10, 20 years have more become exit opportunities for venture capital and private equity firms. So they weren't necessarily raising growth capital as you would traditionally see if we go way back what a, an original IPO was. Now the, the purpose and what we're really seeing the SPAC emerge this year for is to truly raise growth capital for growth businesses. So I indicated, you know, the classic winning SPAC deal is a series D slash E late stage venture capital type exposure in which the company requires significant capital uh, to fund its business plan. So what we're seeing is say a, um, a SPAC raises $200 million. Typically the value of the target that they're looking at will be three to five times that. So say they're combining with a uh, billion dollar company. And so upon that combination, they'll have $2 million, $200 million in cash from the SPAC to fund their growth. And typically you're not seeing exits from backers. Typically they're just rolling their equity into this pro forma entity. And in addition to that, what, what's becoming really popular these days involved in a business combination of a SPAC and a private company is a pipe financing, which is private investment in public equity. And these are sizable. So say you got the $200 million SPAC, the billion dollar equity value of private company, you can see a pipe in the range of 100 to even $500 million such that the amount of shares being issued or the capital raised uh, versus the size of the company is basically unmatched in terms of any other you know, capital raising side of it. And so where SPACs are coming into play are actually funding uh, large growth opportunities, which is different than what we've been seeing uh, in the traditional initial public offering space. As I indicated, generally we're seeing that more so for uh, exit opportunities and not uh, funding growth businesses. So it's an interesting dynamic. The other things that you mentioned uh, make it different. The forward guidance and many of these companies are, are very early stage such that some of them aren't going to generate material revenue till 2025, 2027. So in order to tell that story, many of these are certainly story stocks where you got to have that long-term belief and 
space travel or electric vehicles and things of that nature, where they need to be guiding out to 2025, 2027, and making the comparisons on you know, those revenue or EBITDA figures uh, such that in a traditional IPO, there's no way you can make those statements. And the other thing is uh, timing. You can go public within three months, um, utilizing a SPAC, which is, is significantly quicker than your traditional IPO. But once you add up all the fees, say on our example, a $200 million SPAC, typically the investment bank takes their six to 7%, which is sizable. Then you have the sponsor promote, which I should mention, you know, there is this 20% promote. However, I think that's fairly rare in maintaining that allocation. Typically, they all get scaled back in negotiations, especially with so many SPACs out there. I'm sure they're just getting that uh, grinded down. The other thing we're seeing is uh, many of those convert to more performance-based, where they vest perhaps when the stock goes above $12.50, $15, $20, $20, etc. So the promote generally is smaller than initially thought. Um, so the all-in cost, um, including, you know, if you have a massive pipe, then perhaps it could be cheaper, but if the promote stays large, then it could be more expensive. So it really depends on the deal, whether in fact it is cheaper or more expensive. I'd probably tend to think it's more expensive on average. However, it does have these other unique structures, which is why many um, earlier stage businesses are leaning towards going public via this route. And, and do I recall that Ackman's the the big daddy of them? Uh, a, it hasn't found a target yet. But B, is he he doesn't have a promote, or there's some structure where he's not getting a carry or something? Correct. Yeah. So he was. Why is he doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, who knows? Perhaps uh, you know it's a marketing thing. Obviously, you know Bill Ackman's an ex exceptional marketer, and and. Uh, he, his strategy is more so to bet on the uh, value of the pro forma company. And so all of his exposure is basically through warrants. So it's a, it's a leveraged bet. Um, but yeah, he did famously give up the promote, which is an interesting strategy thus far. We have not seen anyone sort of follow that sanctimonious route. They're all in it for that uh, juicy potential, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cut of the pro forma entity. His, his intentions will be revealed with the fullness of time, perhaps. Uh, okay, let's go back to Chamas IPOQ, December, uh, January 1, 2021. How does he raise the initial billion dollars? Is it hedge funds, pension funds? Is it uh, wirehouses? What, where, is it, where is it all coming from? Yeah, so that's rapidly changing for the, for the longest time. And I initially started following the market. Uh, probably seven, eight years ago, I built my first SPAC arbitrage model and there were less than 10 of these. Very small market and it was you know, completely dominated by hedge funds due to this arbitrage. And so the traditional route is that uh, hedge funds would buy the IPO and basically as liquidity providers and put it on the SPAC sponsor to give them the, the upside of the arbitrage. But now you're seeing different players come into the space just due to the increase in in visibility and the increase in popularity. And not only that, but the quality of sponsor has really gone up significantly, such that now you have Apollo, TPG, Social Capital, Pershing Square, et cetera, et cetera. All these sort of tier one hedge funds, VC firms, and uh, private equity shops, such that they can attract new pools of capital in the IPO. And, and so that's rapidly changing, but it's still, um, you know, a place that's quite dominated by arbitrage hedge funds. All right. So let's walk through, you could use a historical or theoretical kind of uh, typical situation for a SPAC. You know, the, the we could say the Chamath one, or you could use one historically, just to kind of give an idea of how this plays out. Um, but kind of walk us through what the, what a traditional one to two year period is with one of these sort of investments. People subscribe, Billion dollars, then what? Sure. So we can look at DraftKings as an example, which actually started out its life as the special purpose acquisition company known as Diamond Eagle Acquisition. I think it was DEAC. I would at ten dollars uh, per unit in early 2019, and. The interesting thing that happens in SPAC land is generally after 52 days, the units can be split into its contingent parts, the shares and the warrants, they start trading separately. 
which is an interesting dynamic in and of itself. But once that happens, you can generally uh, say uh, the units are trading at $10, they'll split, and the shares will be trading at nine seventy, dollars and the warrants will be $0.30 cents in value. So the way that it works is there's $10 in cash in that SPAC, plus it will accrue interest over time, basically yield the same as treasuries if you subscribe to the IPO. But if you're looking to arbitrage and, and buy it at a discount, once it splits, you're getting the return of treasury yields plus that discount. So it's, if it, you buy it at 970, that's a 3% gross return in a, the worst case scenario over the next two years, plus treasury yields, which before this spring, were kind of in the 1.5 to 2% range. So that was an all in basically very low risk, I consider it no risk return, as long as you can hold it until maturity of earning that. So that's a fairly attractive uh, return in an era of extremely low, basically zero interest rates. So there's this straight cash arbitrage such that you either have liquidation if they don't find a deal, or, and this is a key aspect of the SPAC arbitrage trade is, say they announce a deal and generally three months later, they'll st stage a shareholder vote. Now, it's not the vote that's the important thing, but what they do offer two days prior to the vote is the redemption option. So you can, you always have this option to redeem your shares for what's in the trust account, which is the IPO price, $10, plus the accrued interest of treasury yields over time. So it's a really interesting potential arbitrage where you, I call it heads we win, tails we win big, because in the heads we win scenario, you buy at 970 and say interest accrues and now it's worth $10.20 a year and a half, two years later, then you earn you know, a low single digit annualized kind of low volatility arbitrage return. But where the true juice in the strategy comes from is what I call upside optionality when a deal is announced and the market becomes you know, enamored with the transaction. Specifically on this uh, SPAC that we're discussing, Diamond Eagle, if you go look at the trading in early 2020 or late 2019, they did announce a business combination with DraftKings. And so the stock slowly ticked up, but if you look at the share price before it was uh, one year ago is still at around nine dollars and ninety cents so you can buy it at a discount to net asset value and then uh, this month it went uh, above sixty dollars for sure and uh, over the deal cycle like prior to this vote it went to as high as seventeen dollars which is a seventy percent premium over now so on the base base case of this you're looking at say like a two to three percent return nothing to write home about but you know decent for the worst case scenario However, where you know, my favorite part of the strategy and obviously why many uh, arbitrages are into this type of thing is that a positive, when a positive deal is announced, such as DraftKings, uh, the share price upside can be exceptional where your 3% expected return now turns into 50%, 70%, 100%, where some of them are you know, trading into the 20 to $30 range and that upside optionality can be pretty exceptional. So um, give me a ballpark estimate if you have one, and I imagine this changes over time, but, but kind of two questions is what percentage of deals, uh, what percentage of SPACs actually get consummated with a deal? Is it like half? Is it like 98%? And then second is uh, what percentage of deals once announced have a Positive surprise, and what percentage have a negative surprise? That's a good so question. First one is what percent is actually find a deal? Yeah, and this one obviously changes depending on the market dynamic. Say if we went into a bear market, and it really depends on one thing and one thing only: is the price of the stock above its net asset value? So you got to remember these things are largely held by hedge funds. That when it, when the vote rolls around, if they're not long-term investors. If the share price is above net asset value, then they'll sell out for that. If it's below, then they'll redeem and get their money back and earn that baseline return. So that's the ultimate determinant of success in a deal. There's some things that sponsors can do to mitigate that risk because if too many investors redeem and they don't have any cash left, then they'll just scrap the deal and, and liquidate or perhaps look for a new one. However, you know these uh, concurrent pipe financing mitigate that redemption risk, which is why you're seeing you know, more high quality sponsors 
go um, with those uh, deal structures inclusive of SPACs just to reduce that redemption risk. If I look at uh, our model here, this year we've seen about 95% of SPACs be successful. Um, 21 of the last 22 have actually successfully consummated the deal and now they're trading as these uh, new companies in the market. But historically it was, it was much lower than that. I think the hit rate was below 50% back wow. when you had lower quality sponsors. So it really depends on which era you're talking about and which point in time. Um, so that's important to note because one thing to and consider- then, and, and as far as once the deal is announced, is it typically, is, is a pop typical or is it sometimes they'll like go down by like half? Does that ever happen? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. It, it all depends where the share price was trading. And so if it's one of these ones that no one really cares about and the share price is still at or below now, it can pop pretty significantly. We have seen uh, some tremendous ones. If we look, for example, at Kensington Capital Acquisition, ticker KCAC, they just IPO'd in June at $10 per share, uh, one common share, half a warrant per unit. Uh, early September, they announced an EV battery deal with a company called QuantumScape. Very futuristic, definitely a story stock. If we look at the common shares now, they're trading roughly $14.50, so 45% uh, premium to now. Then on a unit basis, which includes warrants, it's uh, $16 and change. So the warrants can be a key driver of the upside uh, optionality, specifically um, as a unit arbitrage, or say you can buy the units at a discount and the deal just sucks. Say the price is, is five cents below NAV, everyone redeems, but it still gets consummated because they have enough cash or they have this pipe financing. Those warrants can still be worth a lot of money. I was analyzing a recent deal, which was Churchill Capital's uh, merger with Multiplan, which is basically just like a private equity deal. It was not well received. It actually traded at a discount to its NAV. So they did suffer significant redemptions. However, they did uh, go on and become multi-plan as a publicly listed company. Even if you bought it and then redeemed the shares, those warrants do have substantial value that led to like a baseline return of, of 7% annualized just because they provided that upside. Now, in terms of number that are providing a good pop and and what sort of magnitude that could be. I think typically it's in the, you know, the good ones are in the 20 to 50% range. The very good ones can be above 100% in terms of, you know, the premium to net asset value. And um, in terms of the ones that go above 100%, I'd say that's, you know, kind of one in 25%. And the ones that have the sort of 20 to 50% gains, those are more popular, probably, um, you know, a quarter of them. And those that the market just doesn't care, perhaps about half of them will be duds. And so that's something to keep in mind, uh, changing all the time, depending uh, on the market as well. And yes, a good question is on deal announcement, which way would the, would the shares hit? And so it really depends on where the SPAC price was uh, prior to that announcement. If it's one that um, the sponsor perhaps didn't have a great um, marketing ability or, you know, a, a gold-plated reputation in the market say, and it's trading at or below NAV, then, you know, you, you typically could see a very good pop on the first day. On the opposite side of that, take, for example, someone like Chamath, who has, has done six SPACs and his recent ones all traded at massive premiums to NAV in the market. It's in interesting because on one of the transactions that he just announced, and this was for um, is it IPOC? Yeah, so he announced a deal with Clover Health and his SPAC IPOC, which is Social Capital Head of Sophia 3, was trading at a 27% premium to its net asset value pre-deal. And when they announced the deal, it actually dropped double digits. And it's mm -hmm. now it's only trading at 1050, i.e. a 5% premium. So pre-deal speculators paid too much for that one. And you know they're down by over 20% just based on uh, paying too much. And, and the way that we execute our, we stick with like a, a pretty airtight arbitrage strategy where we're always paying at or below NAV where we're not gonna suffer that, that downside. So it certainly takes expertise and you know, substantial modeling such that you know at each point in time where the net asset value is to make sure you're not paying 
too much and, and to confirm that you will be guaranteed this baseline uh, IRR that's relatively attractive. So, you know, if you're thinking about this, the listeners, um, it seems like the main risk, just like with M&A, the main risk being the deal doesn't happen. Um, you know, it feels like, and you can correct me, the main risk in this strategy is even if you're smart and you invest at a discount to NAV, um, the deal gets announced and the stock trades down. Um, let's say it's now at eight bucks for whatever reason. People just hate the acquisition. It's really expensive or, or what, what not. Um, what are the shareholder options there? What percentage of the time does the vote not go through? I imagine it's pretty small, but uh, you, you can correct me. Um, and then do you have the ability to opt out and, and still get redeemed at NAV or is that's not a choice? Once the deal is, is announced and people vote for it, you're kind of you're stuck. How's it work? Yeah, exactly. So after the vote, the deal will close within a day or two and it will be trading under its new ticker. So, and I see people make this mistake. It's uh, a day before the vote and the share tanks. They're like, you know, what's going on? I'm like, well, you missed the redemption date and now it's trading as the uh, post SPAC equity, which I consider like a completely different asset class because it doesn't incorporate that redemption optionality, which is basically like an embedded put in the stock. So if the put option disappears, you know, it can go into free fall. You know, I saw a recently closed SPAC deal that's trading at like $2. <laughs> <laughs> just because you know it was a fairly poor poorly received deal had a bunch of redemptions then it ends up highly leveraged however if we're talking about so you can so just to be clear you can opt out like it's, it's not an all for one one for all if it's like a billion dollars spac and you're like i hate this idea you can yeah. still redeem an nav if you want out or, or that's not the case. correct before the vote yeah you can redeem and so i definitely advise investors considering to redeem to uh, you know, look at SEC filings, calculate what the trust value is. Typically, they disclose it in the proxy and then compare that to the share price because if the, if the NAV's uh, $10.20 and it's trading at $10.30, you're just better off selling it in the market because, you know, this redemption process can be onerous for certain brokerage firms and it can, mm -hmm. you know, cost some money. I think some brokerage firms may charge an investor 50 bucks or something just to, to affect that. But in terms of Pre-deal, you generally don't see them trade down that much just because arbitragers tend to keep them fairly close to the, to the NAV because, you know, in a normal environment, no one's going to let a stock go down to a 20% discount because that's, you know, amazing, basically free money. However, in a 2008, 2009 type scenario where it's a massive liquidity crunch, hedge funds are getting redemptions, you know, they did trade down pretty significantly. We do run a SPAC index and over the first quarter where we had the quickest bear market in history, that index peak to trough went down about 6%. And back then, if you look at uh, my tweets from kind of March, April era, I was tweeting a SPAC of the day where I was highlighting just the great uh, sort of free, risk-free arbitrage returns in the sort of five to 10% annualized range, which unfortunately aren't, aren't there these days. But, um, you know, it's still a, a fairly interesting environment for the strategy. Give it time. I imagine a lot of these new SPAC shareholders will, uh, uh, will, will figure, figure it out and give a lot of opportunity for uh, ARBs like you. So, simple question. It sounds to be too good to be true is the wrong word. But if you have a thoughtful approach, uh, listeners say, okay, why wouldn't I just buy a basket of SPACs? that uh, you know, have IPO'd or subscribed to the IPO, but let's say you know, you're a, a traditional investor. So once they launch, um, as long as I say, I'm gonna buy them under 10 bucks, you know, or whatever it may be, some sort of rule that, that you're not gonna be buying the Chamath one at 15 or something before the announcement, but maybe you cap it at, at whatever it may be. Hold them, hold them till the announcement, uh, you know, and, and either opt out or, or sell, like wh why wouldn't everyone be doing this? Yeah, it's a good question. And it is a fairly labor intensive strategy, uh, like many arbitrage strategies are. So it's, you know, it's more suitable for kind of like a full-time team that's um, monitoring and trading in the market. Uh, historically, we have seen, um, you know, a firm like ours, we do subscribe to IPOs. And historically, we have seen them trade above the IPO price right out of the bat. So it's not necessary that you can get them, you know, at a nice discount to NAV. However, with the massive flood 
of SPACs lately, we're finding that like upwards of 70% are actually trading below their IPO price on a unit basis. Mm -hmm. So that's you know, pretty good value there just because we've had so much issuance and not a commensurate uh, increase in SPAC arbitrage capital, sort of keeping those in line. But in order to run the process, the tricky thing is you never know which is going to be the next Diamond Peak DraftKings deal. Like I said, probably half of them are duds where you got to redeem and get your money back, which can be a process in and of itself. Uh, you know, a quarter of them are decent and maybe, you know, 5% are the huge winners. So you really need to have a super diversified portfolio. Like, like in, in our fund, we own upwards of 80 at the moment. And with, with 80 of these and, and a ton of corporate actions happening, whether it's splitting your units for common shares and warrants, with, which you have to do at some, some time, trading these things, redeeming, voting, monitoring, all the specific dates. It can be quite a process and certainly labor intensive. So, you know, certainly if someone likes that uh, type of strategy, they, they can do it themselves, but just note that it's gonna take many hours per day of work. It's not something that you can just say, just uh, buy a bunch and, and that's it. Um, the other thing to consider is, I think many investors perhaps lack the patience, which is why there's this opportunity. Many don't have the ability to buy something and say, you know, I may make money on this in 18 or 24 months. So that's another reason why I think this opportunity exists is that we put together a portfolio of say, you know, 80, 100 SPAC opportunities of different vintages. So we make sure to diversify. Like we own one that I believe was issued in December of 2017. Everything mm -hmm. from that and everything in between up to ones issued this month. And typically what you see is the older vintages announcing deals. So you always want to, or the way that we execute is we're always cycling capital of the old ones into the new ones. So it is fairly labor intensive, but uh, yeah, great strategy that is, I think, retail dominated, at least in the secondary market. And there's a ton of inefficiencies. It's perhaps the only market that I know of that generally has no buy side coverage, sorry, no sell side coverage. And, you know, there is a few buy side specialists, but it's not, uh, you know, flooded with uh, super, super smart investors keeping it efficiently traded. Yeah, I like many strategies. I put this under the frustration arb or pain in the ass arb where, you know, <laughs> there clearly there's some there there, but the, um, you know, if you don't monitor it and you muck up even a couple trades, it can have a pretty big outsized outcome and the headache of deal, dealing with it. So this must feel a little bit like Christmas for you. Um, you know, I, I've been watching you on Twitter and some of these comments and uh, have always been uh, interested in a way to participate. To, uh, so you, you've alluded to your fund a little bit. What's the ticker? What's the name? Uh, and, and what's the general strategy? I think we got a, a little bit of an idea, but if you flesh out um, kind of the, the approach overall. Yeah, so it's called the Accelerate Arbitrage Fund, ticker ARB, up in Canada. Uh, note that there's a different ARB in the U.S. that does, I believe, merger arbitrage, so <laughs> they're different. Uh, and so what we do is SPAC arbitrage and merger arbitrage. The goal of the strategy is to produce consistent returns and pay out a good yield to investors. So we do pay out a quarterly distribution to investors and really pitching it as perhaps a fixed income alternative such that you can generate a good amount of yield that's consistent and not uh, giving exposure to duration risk. So it's a strategy that can do well in a rising rate environment if and when we ever have that. And uh, the other thing that, that we do uh, consider is the balance between SPAC arbitrage and merger arbitrage. Uh, six months ago, we were probably 30% SPACs, 70% M&A. But ever since the corona pa pandemic, uh, M&A has really dipped down in activity. So there's not a ton to do there. But SPACs have really exploded where you've had four back to back to back to back months of $10 billion issuance. Uh, so $40 billion raised in SPACs since basically June, early summer, and uh, which is this massive because the biggest year for uh, SPAC issuance was 2019 prior to this year where it was like you know well below 20 billion so we, we cracked that easily so a ton going on in SPAC such that our ARB fund uh, now holds about 70% SPAC so it's really kind of the only SPAC focused ETF uh, in the market 
And where we differ is we're just really focused on that arbitrage opportunity. We're not kind of speculating and buying ones way above NAV. We're really trying to provide that baseline return and that low risk nature of the arbitrage opportunity. Well, and you also, um, thoughtfully so, published a lot of literature. We'll link to it in the show notes, some of your articles recently, and also a table of a bunch of the SPACs. What's the name of the table? Yeah, we call it our uh, AlphaRank SPAC monitor. So AlphaRank is just, um, you know, a lot of the alternative data that we utilize to run our alternative ETFs. We publish that for investors just so people know, you know, what we're doing. Hedge fund world is always opaque and highly secretive. I kind of feel like I'm a, a magician giving away all the best tricks because <laughs> I tell investors exactly how it's done at the risk of, you know, the inefficiencies being competed away. But at the end of the day, we just really haven't seen that uh, as of this moment. Just because I said, uh, you mentioned this pain in the ass nature of it. It's not an easy thing to do. It requires a significant amount of work. I've read, I read basically every SEC filing that comes out on the SPAC. There's now like over 200 of them. So there's definitely a ton of work and you can't really do it as a part-timer. What's the, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of this increased um, transition of hedge fund like strategies uh, into public liquid vehicles when they can be. There's obviously things like cat bonds you can't really put into an ETF, but this is one that I love and it's always been the purview of, of private funds like you yourself have been running for a long time, but giving, uh, giving broad investors, not just individuals, but also advisors access to this. I think you're going to see, um, you know, a ton of interest from uh, all the conversations I'm having with investors about what in the world do you do with bonds now? Um, and, and in the U.S. being a, a higher yielding bond market, but certainly in the rest of the world where many bonds are trading at zero and negative to have something like this that, uh, you know, has some somewhat of a a um, mixed hybrid sort of characteristics where it has the sort of bond traditional, um, you know, floor with a, with a potential upside. Um, let's talk about, uh, you've seen some trends. There's been uh, some um, announcements from Vision Fund, from VCs starting to do SPACs. Uh, is this, is this going to start to get into some weird conflicts of interest? You know, I could have a, have a scenario where a venture capital does a SPAC just to take one of their companies public. I don't know if they would double dip, if they do the promote. I have, who knows what Masa-san's doing, uh, Masayoshi-san. Uh, any thoughts in general? Yeah, that is uh, certainly a concern uh, regarding conflicts of interests where you have a lot of kind of VC firms, private equity firms potentially, you know, double dipping. And, you know, there's a lot of disclosure, but at the end of the day, I think the market is decent at uh, figuring these things out. If we, if we look back at the attempted WeWork IPO, I think the market digested that and served as like a good sheriff. And, you know, as more and more uh, post SPAC equities start trading. I always think of the best sheriff in the market being short sellers. And so if short sellers start to uh, sniff out something that is, is wrong or raises red flags, especially with the democratization of information on services such as Twitter, where a ton of super smart investors are gathered and information tends to spread very, very quickly. And you know, I think the opportunity to pull a fast one on investors these days really isn't there like it like it used to be where you wouldn't ha be having these super intelligent financial analysts and you know capital market salutes uh, figure these things out and sort of mitigate that risk but you know as in anything you can see some hijinks happening like we we almost saw on the, the we we work ipo which uh you know could have been a, a huge loser <laughs> And the greatest disinfectant, which is just the internet. You know, I mean, the, the funny thing is these blank check companies have been around since the time of the South Sea bubble 300 years ago. Um, and then SPACs kind of in the 80s, uh, like you mentioned, there's a little more kind of bad behavior and the SEC started passing rules and cleaned it up a bunch. Uh, and uh, you've seen it kind of come full circle in the last 20 years, but it's good to see that, um, you know, I, I think the, the players like Chamath are, honest, uh, you know, at, at least and in, in seem um, to be a high quality of companies that are coming out. Although you're starting to see a few kind of weird deals. I've seen a few lately where I kind of scratch my head and say, huh, 
that's an interesting pivot and or valuation. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any um, currently, to the extent you can talk about positions, um, I don't know if you can, but are, what, what's the lay of the land here in uh, fall time 2020? Are there a lot of opportunities trading below NAV? Is it things uh, you track a yield composite? I know. Uh, what's, what's things look like? Yeah, so somewhat middle of the ground, and I really differentiate between uh, pre-deal SPACs and post-deal SPACs because, you know, there have been studies that show post-deal SPAC performance uh, isn't the greatest. There is significant underperformance, especially on a median basis. Uh, it's interesting, I crunched the numbers on the uh, last 20 uh, post-deal SPACs. They had average share price performance of negative 19% but positive 13% on a median basis. So somewhat of a Pareto distribution in terms of post-deal SPAC share price performance where you have the odd huge winner like a, a DraftKings or a Nikola or, or something of that nature, but uh, a lot of losers, you know, more analogous to a venture capital type exposure. But where we see the market currently, I think it's fairly attractive. Uh, for a while, the average yield was negative but now it's ticked up back to positive, which just means if you bought them all, then you know, have, a, have a decent chance of earning a positive return. Uh, whereas we just focus on the ones trading at a discount. Uh, there are a number of um, ones yielding in the two to 4% annualized range to liquidation with no upside optionality priced in. So I like to compare those to like a, um, uh, quote unquote, safe merger arbitrage spread if we make that comparison to say the recently announced Morgan Stanley Eaton Bands deal, which last time I checked was trading kind of 2.5% annualized in which you have deal risk, you know, a SPAC arbitrage where it's basically holding treasuries at 3% is perhaps, you know, more attractive on a relative basis compared to a safe uh, merger arbitrage transaction. And the other aspect is massive flood of supply. This month, uh, halfway through October, we're already at 10 billion in SPAC issuance, which is tying July for the most of all time in terms of months. And mm -hmm. July included Ackman's $4 billion raise. And so the market's been absolutely flooded, but you know, arbitrageurs like us, other hedge funds, really haven't seen, uh, certainly haven't seen $10 billion in inflows. And so you're seeing a lot of these IPOs break price where you can buy, um, you know, instead of subscribing at $10 and then seeing trade up to 10, 20, 10, 30, you're now seeing IPO subscribers get run over with a truck and the SPAC trades down to 990, 985. So certainly, you know, do-it-yourself investors, I think it's a good idea to be looking at a lot of these recent issues specifically on the first day because there's a lot of volume and, and they have been trading down unless you're someone like chamath who credit to him he issued 2.1 billion of SPACs this month into an already very very flooded market and for some context 2.1 billion was about three percent of the entire market cap and all of them traded up to premiums of uh, between three and seven percent on the first day Whereas uh, you look at 70% of the other recently issued SPACs and they're trading down to a discount upon new issuance. So that's one. And, and, why, and why is that? Why, why would they trade down? Like who's, who's selling those at that point? Or is it just not really a, a float or a market? What's the reasoning? Yeah, just too much supply. And one interesting dynamic is, you know, from someone who subscribes to IPOs a few months ago, we're getting maybe like 10% allocations and they're trading up quite a bit. So as an IPO subscriber, if you're only getting 10%, then you're maybe like, okay, I'll, you know, I, I actually want a uh, hundred thousand shares, but I'll put in for uh, 500,000 and hope to get my hundred thousand. Right. But as uh, pricing starts to get weaker post IPO, people start scaling that back such that, you know, now you're getting full allocations and the people that oversubscribe, they're like, oh crap, I have 400,000 too many shares because I didn't think I'd get a full allocation. Uh, the market's changed and, you know, there's somewhat of a buyer's strike and you're not seeing the post uh, issuance support because there's just so much supply out there. You know, why buy this one for at 995 if I can buy this other one at, at 990 just because you know the potential return is greater and like i indicated i don't think there's a great correlation between sponsor quality 
in arbitrage return because typically with a high profile sponsors, say like a, a social capital, those generally trade at, at large premiums. So a lot of that is baked in. And the other thing to consider is we did discuss post SPAC equity performance. A lot of the alpha is in the, the pre-deal um, era in which mm -hmm. You know they outperform there. I did see a note by Goldman Sachs. They did do a study such that um, there was significant outperformance in pre-deal SPACs, and then on the other hand, you do have post SPAC equities that tend to underperform. So there are some other interesting opportunities on SPACs with uh, greater vintages. But one thing that I noticed, and I'm not sure if this has ever been discussed, so perhaps some uh, ex exclusive content here for your listeners, Meb, is that uh, there's this dynamic where you can subscribe to uh, unit IPO and uh, these days even buy them at a discount where a unit is common shares and warrants. And after 52 days, they can, these can split into common shares and the warrants. And the interesting thing about that split is typically accompanied with that is this value lift on a unit basis because for the common share side, say they trade down to 970, which is an attractive return for you know, cash IRR type arbitragers where they look at the discount and be like, okay, this is easy money. Then on the warrant side, you have speculators who come in who just want that levered exposure to SPAC warrants. And you have these two different uh, contingents of buyers buying these separate securities, which the end result pushes up the unit price. So I have this interesting analysis that I'm working on that looks at unit discounts pre split like you know early on in their life and then unit premiums uh later on in their life where there's this inherent value uplift after they split you have different buying pushing it from a discount to a premium so it's an interesting what i call alternative yield where it's not your traditional oh i buy a bond it pays me three percent and I, I guess that's a junk bond these days or a quote high yield bond but you can get this alternative yield through capital gains buying a SPAC at a discount and then six months later, uh, 12 months later, it, it trading up to say a 5% you know, premium on a unit basis just to, due to these buyer dynamics. Hmm. What's the, uh, I think you'll be very successful with this. It's a cool strategy. What's capacity? Uh, can you put a hundred million to work, a billion, 10 billion, a hundred billion? Where does it start to get, uh, get, uh, get uh, a little constrained? Yeah, it really depends on the environment. Like I said, the past four months, we've seen $10 billion of issuance. So I could easily put $500 million to work in this market. But I always worry about, you know, what happens if there's no SPACs issued for a long time. Uh, you know, I doubt that's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, this market, I do consider it frothy. I don't think we'll be, con you know, continuing at this space, um, say, six months from now. However, in the near term, say over the next two, three months, I still expect a significant amount of issuance. We do monitor new S1 filings uh, at the SEC and, and S1s are, you know, prospectuses for new issuance. And we're just seeing a ton of those. So a lot of groups putting together new SPACs, sometimes three to four per day and a significant uh, new IPO issuance. We expect more than 100 SPACs to be outstanding by year end and wouldn't be surprised to see this market get to over $100 billion in the near term. But certainly investors should be cognizant of the fact that, you know, we could be in a bit of a frothy market. Not sure if I'd consider it a bubble because you can still see attractive valuations with respect to net asset value and you can generate positive returns. So I think there's still juice to be squeezed with it. And with the massive flood of supply, I think that investors can still put in a large amount of capital because the opportunity is still there. Fun. Um, Julian, this has been super educational. Where do people go? We'll add links to the show notes, of course, but where do people go if they want to read your articles, uh, keep uh, up to date with your alpha tables and everything else? Where do they find you? Yeah, so we publish all that on our website, accelerateshares.com. Alternatively, if you just Google search SPAC arbitrage, like I think everything that pops up is probably written by me. <laughs> uh, check me out on Twitter. I publish all our research through Twitter as well. Uh, that's at Julian Klamachko. It's my handle. And then uh, on our podcast, Absolute Return Podcast, we're always talking about SPAC deals, uh, M&A deals, and, and things of that nature. And so really just providing weekly commentary on how that market is developing. And it's a crazy market in that it seems to be different 
uh, week over week, like we had, you know, earlier this month, uh, social capital issued 2.1 billion of SPACs. And, you know, month to date in October, it's just been absolutely gangbusters. So it's a market that is changing dramatically and we expect it to continue to do so in the near term. So super exciting. Awesome. Julian, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Meb. Always happy to be here.